trying to fuss with us coming off of Mercer. And, you know, now they've ripped up another whole building and a whole block is now gone and they've taken up all these buildings. And well, the area is really is nicer than it used to be. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was mm-hmm. industrial ghetto. I know. They're turning into this little yuppie hangout now. Yeah, a little pet house. Yeah, exactly. Bustling. So Drew, your are recording. As you pace around. He works in this room. <laughs> you know what's funny is I didn't go last week and it was just a black screen and then all of a sudden it was you. Like you were walking up walking a little thing and then all of a sudden it was like, oh, and then it was dead. So the issue was, yeah, we were in a different room and then we did a dry run and we went over there and I can record it through our website yeah. and I type it out. Well, I didn't realize you couldn't record two things at once. So that's why I was like, oh, that may be it. So I ran over here and stopped that recording, but there's a 10, 20 minute leeway beyond. So I picked up the last few minutes of the yeah. talk. Which yeah, no, I wonder where the electrons get shuffled to make 20 minutes when you push a button. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. At the yeah. speed of like, light. Oh, it's probably somewhere. It must go out in the solar system somewhere. Saying, oh, you, you know, it's just a black screen and I can hear buzz. I don't know. That's the thing, we put it in a year in advance. So. Well, now, now you tell them we want for the next five years. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the early years of the memorial. Sure. Yeah, you said the room was reserved. It came back in and nobody knew what we saw that. Yeah, so they nice. reserved it. Right, a year and a half ago, but they don't remember that they're they reserved. Forgot they forgot they were reserved. So, Drew, did you get your aspirin stuff up and going? Yeah. Are you doing it now? Yeah. Oh, I got some good stress. My, uh... Actually, we had a drop of 6%. That would be one. 6%? 60. 60. Oh, that's different. You <laughs> sure? Yeah, he's impressive. You're but you didn't have to intubate him. How old? How old? Turn right around. How old? He's older. Yeah, 39. Year old. He's probably older than he's a speaker. Well, since my partner who knows how to do it doesn't want to do it because she doesn't make any money, we're going to have to start sending him to you anyway. Yeah. She can. still working on the billing aspect. But She's used to doing it under the inpatient billing at Scripps. So doing it as an outpatient, she makes more as a consult because she doesn't pass more. Yeah, but sometimes you do things because it's the right thing to do. I'm not arguing with that. Oh. I'm not arguing with I'm not oh. arguing with that. How many moral challenges have we done for food and we don't get paid very much? We get paid peanuts. Oh. Yeah, that's the way some of these things it are It does make it better, but you know. Or I'll put a green ring in this ring. It's that third, fourth, and fifth hours where you really get the yeah. reimbursement. Well, now that they've changed their aspirin. 95079 is where it's at. So Matt, how many times have you almost been killed riding your bike around down here? I saw a guy. I saw a guy this morning riding up Pike Street on his bike, going up towards uh, wherever, towards, towards Warren. These two cars just about hit him. They start flipping the guy off for riding his bike, and I'm sitting there like, all he's doing is riding up the hill. Let me guess, no light, no helmet. No, he had Christmas lights on. I mean, he looked like he was a Christmas tree going up the hill. But they're just nasty to this guy. I was like, man. No, I just... You get a lot of finger gestures in your morning commute. Very impressive. So far, so good. Just hearing about the turbios from last week. That was the last year. Yeah. They were bleeding themselves. They didn't need it. They had to reduce stress. <laughs> so they, a lot of them ended up with surgery. Transfusions all the time. And then all of a sudden, uh, but 
I'm not sure this is going to go exactly as I thought it was going to go because I, I sent you all, ah yes, there's the man. All right, just in the nick of time. So uh, I think most of you saw an email that unfortunately, because we had a different room last week, in spite of Drew's very best efforts, we didn't broadcast and we didn't have any meaningful recording. And so our outside virtual audience was not happy with me or Drew or the, even though they get the whole thing for free, they complain a lot. So I, I imposed on Troy to come back for 20 minutes and talk three times as fast and quickly give us a, a redo. I figured those of us in the room anyway who are old forgot what he said a week ago anyway. But he's got to get to clinic, so he's going to quickly uh, give us a retake. The word for today is extra esophageal. All right, well, thanks for inviting me back. I wasn't expecting to be back quite so soon. <laughs> Anyway, um, thank you. So we're going to just touch on some high points real quick. So, um, actually, those are my disclosures. Let's see here. Okay, so um, what we talked about last week and what I'll talk about briefly this week is um, some new things for sort of, sort of some things that I think are uh, pertinent um, to really the last year, few years maybe, um, but some things that have really, I guess, I guess have crystallized over the last year. Um, the first of those is some things about diagnostics, and I'll just mention a couple of things there. Uh, some uh, interesting groups of new defects that in, in a couple of really important signaling pathways in the immune system, and we'll talk about those briefly as well, and highlight um, two um, defects that you may see in your clinics, uh, in adult allergy clinics, uh, I think there's a good chance that you're going to see some of these patients because 
we've been uh, getting referrals uh, from folks across the country for our diagnostic lab and, and making these diagnoses so uh, from, from a variety of clinics. So in terms of the diagnostics piece, uh, a couple of things that I want to just touch on briefly is sort of the current state of gene sequencing because gene sequencing, there's a lot of discussion about this and um, uh, so I'll talk briefly about that. Uh, a brief a touch on newborn trek screening uh, for SCID because uh, uh, as many of you know this was approved by the state legislature and will begin in the state of Washington in uh, the next uh, month or so in January. It's the plan to go live. Um, we're not going to talk about flow cytometry or uh, screening for hypogammaglobulinemia. So let's just talk briefly about sequencing. I just want to remind you that there's a couple of ways that sequencing are done. So there's the old-fashioned Sanger method of sequencing, uh, and uh, I won't go into the details. This is really the gold standard. This is what's on the left side, and it really uh, the, the bottom line here is that you, in order to sequence, you have to amplify each fragment that you want to sequence. You have to amplify from the genome using polymerase chain reaction, you amplify that piece, and then you sequence that piece. And so it's very reliable, it's been around for a long time. The downside of it is that it's um, very labor intensive, and you don't, you work a lot to get a relatively small amount of data, okay? So um, this is what the outputs, many of you have seen sequencing chromatograms as they come off these machines. So the alternative is this, uh, Next generation sequencing, people have heard about this for a few years now, um, but the bottom line here is that you take the whole genome, you fragment it up into pieces, and these pieces typically range between 500 and 1,000 base pairs long. You fragment it, you can either do it enzymatically, or most people actually just use a sonicator, ultrasonic vibration, basically just shear up the DNA into these fragments. And then you capture those fragments and you, the sequencing is done, it's what we call sequencing by synthesis. So uh, it's basically a big PCR reaction and as new bases are added, um, it sort of, it, it watches as a new base is added and says, okay, on, on this particular sequence, it's added an A and on this one a T. And it sort of keeps track of which bases get added in a row. And so what, what this, the, the bottom line is what this allows you to do is it allows you to sequence massive amounts of DNA. Okay, so we can sequence the entire genome, okay, now. Um, or you can, what you can do is you can take all of those sheared up fragments and you can just select the pieces that you wanna sequence. And so you can capture those, you can basically make oligonucleotides to just capture those pieces that you want to sequence, whether it's just the, what we call the exome or the part of the genome that, that that makes the proteins, the exons, you can just capture all of those and sequence those and forget about everything else. Or you can do more selected capture. And so what you can do is you, you can say, I'd like to capture all of the exons, all of the protein coding regions from these 100 genes. Okay. And you just capture those and you throw everything else away. Okay. But you can capture those, sequence them all simultaneously. And those are uh, sort of uh, an approach where you can capture smaller groups of proteins. Now, or sorry, smaller groups of uh, protein coding sequences. So again, the, just a reminder, some of you have seen this before, but the, the bottom line is when you do a whole genome, you're left with a lot of data. So uh, there's about 3 billion base pairs in a single genome, okay? And war and peace is about 3 million characters. And so if you sequence the whole genome, you have to sift through basically a thousand copies of war and peace to try and find that one word that's misspelled, okay? If you whittle that down to the exome or just the protein coding parts of the gene, then it's just 10 copies of war and peace that you have to look through to try and find the misspelled word. But as you can see, it's a, a big data problem, and this is um, part of the challenge with these. So this uh, was a paper that was published in October in the New England Journal from uh, the Baylor Whole Exome Sequencing Corps. They do this clinically, so you can send out a clinical whole exome Okay, and they'll do whole exome sequencing, and they reported the results of their first 250 whole exomes. And I, there's a couple of really important takeaway points here. One of them being that the um, of those 250 whole exomes, they only found the causative gene in 62 cases. Okay, about 25 percent. And if you talk to people who are doing this for a living, they'll tell you that this is about average. And part of this is because of the technology, it, the way that the sequencing is done that misses certain types of mutations. Uh, part of it has to do with uh, just the, the massive amount of data and limitations in interpreting that data. So, uh, um, and, and some of it has to do with the fact that 
probably a lot of mutations that cause disease are in the non-protein coding parts of the genome, in the, in the, in the introns and in the parts that you don't capture in a whole exome. So that's the first important takeaway point is that 25% of the time, so you have to do four exomes to be able to find one defect, okay, is the bottom, the bottom line there. The other thing that I think is super interesting and very important is that in four patients, so about 6% of those who they found the, a, a causative defect in, they actually found two causative defects. So two related mutations in, in related pathways, either of which could have caused the disease. And we've certainly seen this. This has been reported in the, in the immunologic literature. Uh, I mentioned a case last time I was here about a patient a family that we had sequenced for uh, one defect, and it turns out that they had, didn't have that one, but they had two other defects. Uh, that uh, both of, in, in immunodeficiency-related genes. Uh, and, uh, you know, their phenotype was sort of a mix of these two. So there's really, I, the bottom line is this. There's really levels of genetic testing that you can order now. So you can do the old-fashioned Sanger single-gene sequencing. And so if you've got, uh, if you've got a toddler boy uh, who has no B cells and no immunoglobulin, you may just want to sequence the BTK gene, right? You don't need to do whole exome sequencing because he probably has excellent a, a gamma globulinemia, right? So, but the bottom line is that it's, these, it's, it's, this is gold standard. It works really well, but it is expensive because it's labor intensive, okay? So if you, uh, and then the next step up is to step into this next generation sequencing. And the thing that a lot of labs are doing now, including our own lab, is that we're beginning to offer these next generation disease panels. And so we'll soon have a panel um, within a couple of months that will be offered clinically that has 80 genes on it that are all of the SCID genes, all of the combined immunodeficiency genes, all of the congenital A gamma globulinemia genes, for instance. So it's all of the lymphocyte defects that you order and you get at one time. And the cost of that is going to be equivalent, probably, it's going to be in the neighborhood of ordering about three genes by Sanger sequencing. So if you think, I, you know, I'm going to order five or six genes on this kid because I don't know what it is, it's going to be cheaper just to do the, these panels, okay? Uh, then you can step up to whole exome sequencing, which is just the protein coding part of the gene, or whole genome sequencing if you want to be really spendy uh, and um, go for it. So that's that. Uh, that's the update on sequencing. Just a reminder that uh, new, uh, newborn screening for SCID is going live in this state. Um, and uh, in, in January, uh, the sequencing is done by quantitation of these TRECs, which are these T-cell receptor, sorry, excision circles that are fragments of the chromosomes that are cut out as the T-cell receptor gene rearranges. And these little circles of DNA can be quantitated. Um, and... Uh, Let's see here. There we go. These little circles of DNA can be quantitated by quantitative PCR, and these circles of DNA are generated in a naive T cell, and as that T cell then expands and makes daughter cells, those treks, they don't replicate like the rest of the genome, and they get diluted out. And so babies that have, first of all, more T cells than adults do, and they've got all of their T cells are naive, they have very high TREK levels if you just take a peripheral blood draw, and in this case, we're taking the dried blood spots off the, off the blood cards. They've got very high TREK levels. Old guys like me, whose thymus is starting to poop out, um, we, I, I have much lower TREK levels because, first of all, my lymphocyte counts are lower than those in a baby, about a third of those in an infant, and I've got many fewer naive T cells because I've, my immune system has experienced things. Okay, so that's the, that's the TREK testing. It'll go live um, in this state uh, in January. And interestingly, um, we um, were out on Friday meeting with the state newborn screening folks uh, to map out the plan for how these babies are gonna be followed from the time that they're uh, identified to the time that they're seen and, and treated in our clinic. And they had done, uh, blind, they had done a blinded set of uh, samples from this last month from December. And lo and behold, they got a hit. The problem is they were blinded samples and they couldn't go back and find the baby. And on Saturday, a baby showed up at our, we, Suzanne Scotta smith was asked to consult on an infant in our hospital who was uh, born three weeks ago, who looks like a complete George and has uh, very low tracks, uh, really unmeasurable tracks. So it may be that baby, we're not sure, either that or there's another skid baby floating around out there in the, in the state. 
uh, it's, it's, I mean, we've already got a hit <laughs> unknowing uh, we, uh, in, in the state of Washington. We've, we've actually gone back and pulled that baby's card and redone the tracks, and in fact, they're low. So anyway, that's uh, sort of an interesting aside. All right, let's talk about a couple of interesting signaling pathways that are extremely important in the immune system, okay? And some interesting defects that you may see in your clinics. The first of these is the JAK-STAT uh, um, signaling pathway. I'll talk about that in a second. And the second of these is the NF-kappa-B signaling pathway. Each of these is uh, important for a variety of immune functions. These are probably the two, I, I would say, the two most important intracellular signaling pathways in immunology, probably. Uh, others may, who study other pathways may argue, but um, I, I think these two are used by s such important immune um, uh, pathways that, that they really deserve a lot of attention and they're worth just reminding ourselves about. Let's talk first about the JAK-STAT pathway. So the STATs are these transcription factors. There's seven of them, STAT1 through STAT6. There's two STAT5s. Uh, but uh, that are these are transcription factors, and I'll show you how they get activated. The JAKs, uh, there's four of these tyrosine kinases, and this is the story here. So these, the, this pathway is activated by a whole variety of cytokines and growth factors, okay? And the way that it works is that you've got the cytokine receptor, typically here at the cell membrane, and these cytokine receptors are bound by these JAK kinases. So these JAK kinases, this affinity between the receptor and the JAK kinase is so high that it's almost like a single unit, okay? Very high affinity interactions between the JAK kinase and the cytokine receptors. These receptors have on them tyrosine residues, and when a cytokine binds to the receptors, it aggregates the receptors together, and it brings these JAK kinases close to one another on the intracellular tail of the cytokine receptors, and these then cross-phosphorylate the receptor chains on tyrosine, okay, so as shown here. Once a tyrosine is phosphorylated, it can be bound by, uh, by what are called SH2 domains. These are domains in proteins that are like little pockets that bind to phosphorylated tyrosine residues, okay? And the STAT proteins all have an SH2 domain on them, and so when the, once the receptor gets phosphorylated, it recruits a st these STAT proteins. They bind to the receptor via their little pocket SH2 domain. And then the JAK kinases phosphorylate a critical tyrosine residue on the STAT proteins. And what happens is then the STAT proteins, they dimerize because they get um, uh, the, SH, the SH2 domain on one binds to the tyr phosphotyrosine on the other, and they form these dimers those then go into the nucleus and they bind to DNA and they turn on gene transcription, okay? And so this is what they actually look like. Uh, so this is DNA looking down the barrel of DNA. This is one step, one, uh, this is stat one. So, whoops, sorry. This is one of the members of the dimer. This is the other one. And those phosphotyrosine and SH2 domains are up here that sort of pin them together. And they're like a pair of pliers that sort of clamp onto the DNA and they regulate gene transcription. Okay, so that's how these things work. And really the thing that's, it, we, this has sort of been emerging over the last uh, few years, but the thing that's really become quite interesting about this pathway is that you can get single point mutations that can either decrease the function of the JAKs or STAT proteins, or they can increase the function of the JAKs or STATs depending on where in the protein those mutations. And in fact, for instance, in cases like STAT1, there's one type of immunodeficiency, which, is, which involves invasive mycobacterial disease and viral infections, where there's loss of STAT1 function. And these, um, so STAT1 activity is turned down. And there's a whole different type of immunodeficiency that, it, that really involves chronic muc mucocutaneous candidiasis and autoimmunity that is caused by mutations that cause a gain of STAT1 function. Okay, so different phenotypes, depending on where in the protein the mutation occurs, some of them cause a loss of function, some of them cause a gain of function, but they give you two different clinical phenotypes, even though the mutations are in the same gene, okay? And I think this is one of the things that's really come to light in this pathway, and it's highlighted that the possibility, there, there's a huge number of possibilities. You see there's still 
cases where we haven't identified um, defects in these pathways, I would predict that over the next few years, the, a lot of these negatives are going to be filled in with, with cases where we find um, clinical syndromes that are caused by either loss or gain of functions in this pathway. Okay, super interesting. I want to tell you about one disorder that you may actually see in your clinics, and it's these gain of function mutations in STAT1. And these have come to light um, over the last uh, couple of years. They were initially described by a couple of groups, Jean Ron Casanova's group and a group in Germany. Um, and these were described in patients with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. These are single point mutations. So again, STAT1, you've got two, two genes for STAT1 in your genome. It only requires a mutation in one of those genes to cause this defect, okay? So it's a dominant, autosomal dominant, gain of function mutation. So it, uh, what happens is that the STAT1 actually gains activity so that it, the, the amount of STAT1 function in the cell goes up. So there's more activity than usual, okay? And what happens is these patients were initially described with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Um, again, you'll see that in many of these families, there, some of the families there's family history, but some of them there's not. Because again, these can occur as spontaneous mutations, no family history, and it's a dominant gain of function. So chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis is one symptom. We now know that these, can, these patients can also have other invasive fungal infections. So things like um, uh, histoplasmosis, um, uh, other crypto... Uh, crypto caucus, um, other uh, invasive fungal infections have been identified uh, in, with uh, these defects. Um, also, severe autoimmunity has been identified in these patients. So we've described, recently published with Steve Holland's group, a, a group of patients who have an IPEX-like phenotype. They have severe autoimmune disease, and we've actually found more of the pa more patients like that since we since we reported that uh, related to this. And so the phenotypic spectrum is quite bright, quite broad. And I'll tell you that in our diagnostic lab, our hit rate on this for in in patients is pretty high. I mean, I don't. It's probably about one in four patients that we receive for sequencing. We identify these mutations. Uh, it's amazing actually how many of these patients are floating around out there. So m adults, many of them. Some of them kids. So you might see these patients in your clinic. Again, chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. Uh, some of these patients are described as having CDID. We made a diagnosis on a, on a, on a young child a couple of weeks ago, a, a, little, a child from Florida. And, uh, and this child had mucocutaneous candidiasis and autoimmunity. But her father had died in his 40s of CVID. And, uh, and so some of these patients can have a CVID sort of picture, okay? There's a humoral defect. What happens here is that under normal circumstances, STAT1 gets, when you activate the cells, for instance, with interferon gamma, um, STAT1 gets phosphorylated. And then over time, so this is one, uh, 30 minutes, 60, 120 minutes, it, it gets phosphorylated. And then its phosphorylation drops back down a little bit. In these patients, again, it's a gain of function. So you stimulate their cells with interferon gamma, and it gets hyperphosphorylated and it doesn't decrease. So these cells feel like they're under chronic interferon gamma drive, so TH1 drive, which we think may be why the autoimmunity happens. Not sure, okay? So anyway, that's one defect that you might see. The other defect that I wanted to just touch on, touch base on real quick is in this NF-kappa B signaling pathway. I'm not gonna focus really on how these are activated, just the fact that NF-kappa B, there's two pathways of NF-kappa B activation. One is what we call the canonical pathway, and then there's a non-canonical pathway. The canonical pathway is what's activated acutely. So rapid activation, it's rapid on, rapid off, okay? The non-canonical pathway is a slower activation, and it's sort of a longer-term activation. And just in, to tell you, the, the things that, that activate the NF-kappa B that are pathway that are kind of important in the immune system are, of course, toll-like receptors work through the NF-kappa B pathway. CD40. Uh, the T cell receptor, the B cell receptor, pa things that are fairly important in immunity work through the NF-kappa B pathway. So you can imagine that defects in this pathway are going to affect a lot of things, okay? And that's turned out to be the case. What I do want to highlight is that the in, in red here, there have now been a number of defects in this pathway, several of which have been identified just in the past year and reported, uh, that have really crystallized 
this pathway. And the things that I'll highlight are the fact that defects in the canonical pathway, so the rapid on pathway that's downstream particularly of toll-like receptors, these are things like Nemo, ICAP B alpha, these are severe diseases. Sometimes they're almost skid-like, other times they're bad but not quite skid-like. Whereas defects in the non-canonical pathway are emerging with uh, phenotypes that are sort of like a combined immunodeficiency and even kind of a CVID-like phenotype. And one that I'll just highlight here, well, there's a couple. One is PI3 kinase P110 delta, uh, and then the uh, NF-kappa B P100. These two defects have been identified now in patients who have a CVID phenotype. These patients, or the, these patients who are reported with these mutations, these patients were adult or, or, or they, so they had childhood onset CVID, but the diagnosis was made in young adults in each of these cases. So they screened 30, 30, about 35 of their patients or families who had CVID. Uh, this is a group in Utah. And they found, they did it by whole exome sequencing. They found two of those families who had defects in P100. And what I want to point out is that these are, again, autosomal dominant. It only requires one mutation to have the phenotype. So you don't necessarily need a family history. These can occur sporadically. Similarly, in the P PI3 kinase P110 delta mutations, there's been two uh, case series, each of them with seven families. So 14 families described at least so far, one from the NIH, one from Paris, France. And um, these families, these patients have a combined immune deficiency. So, but it really seems like it's more of a B cell defect, CVID sort of phenotype. Again, these are autosomal dominant. It only requires one mutation to get the disease. These patients have a propensity to go on and develop B cell malignancies. So these would be CVID patients who get, maybe even with a little combined immunodeficiency flavor, who get B cell malignancies, okay? And I'll tell you that one of the guys, uh, an immunologist in Alabama, Prescott Atkinson, who sends us a fair number of samples for our diagnostic lab, he emailed me last week and said, hey, are you guys uh, starting to sequence this yet? He said, we participated in the NIH study. He said, we took our, we took our cohort of CVID patients and we just sent them a, a, a number of them. He didn't tell me how many he'd sent, but, but you know, several families, they got five hits, five families. So, so this is probably more common than we yet appreciate. It was just reported this year. And I would just, I tell you these two defects because again, these can occur sporadically. Uh, and again, autosomal dominant, no family history necessarily and can show up. So in, with a CVID or a, or a CID, combined immunodeficiency phenotype, okay? So these are defects that you may be following in some of your clinics. And I would encourage you, uh, you know, look at the papers. They're pretty interesting and keep your eyes open for these patients. And we're happy to work with you to try and sort out, uh, could they have any of these defects? So, all right? So. That's where I'll stop. That's the brief highlight, uh, uh, and uh, be happy to take any quick questions. Are there any drugs nearing? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Are there any drugs nearing evolution that we can do anything for these people other than just IVIG? Um, no, <laughs> not not for these actually yet. So, uh, in in fact. Uh, these guys, the PI3 kinase patients, probably need to go to bone marrow transplant because of the risk of, uh, we don't know for sure yet, there have been a couple that have been transplanted, but because of the risk of malignancy uh, is fairly high in these patients. These patients we really don't know, uh, actually, yet. There's only two families described. And in the STAT1 gain of function patients, we don't know how to treat those patients, actually. The ones who've got severe autoimmunity, there have been uh, three patients that I'm aware of that have been bone marrow transplanted who've got the severe autoimmune phenotype and they respond to bone marrow transplant. But we don't know, in the patients with milder disease, what do we do with those? And some of those patients have really bad chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis that's, that's, that can be very debilitating in some of these patients. And uh, we don't know what to do with those patients yet, besides, you know, you treat them with fluconazole until they become resistant to that, and, you know, you, circuit, you, know, you sort of cycle through all of, the, all of the fungal treatments. But beyond that, there's not a lot yet that we know about. So people who are getting, like, IVIG for they, they were, you know, they've been on it for like 10 years for common variable. Do, do you ever recommend that they go back and get some testing done just to see if 
Yes, if, absolutely. If their phenotype um, would fit. So, I mean, there are these patients with CVID who just get out, you know, they get nothing but infections. They're, you know, they're, I think those are probably going to be lower yield than the ones who clearly have this more combined phenotype. You know, there's there's this subset of CVID, CVID patients. We've all seen them. Typically, they've got also their T cells may be low or maybe their T cells don't proliferate totally normally. These are the ones that also typically get the autoimmunity, the lymphadenopathy, the you know, granulomatous lung disease. Those patients, I think, are going to be a fertile field for looking for other defects, at least in this initial phase of looking at these patients. So absolutely, uh, if, you know, we, we look carefully at these phen phenotypes, there's some things that can give you the cl some clues. Again, these guys, some of these patients have more of a combined phenotype with some T-cell proliferative problems uh, or, or low T-cell counts. Uh, and T-cells, actually these patients, their T-cells sort of senesce as they get older, so they have a progressive uh, defect in the T-cell compartment. These patients of the two families that were described, they've got central adrenal hyperplasia, so, so ACTH problems. So that may be a clue, but again, it's only two families, so we don't know. But again, if, there's, if these are pa patients with sort of CVID or hypogammaglobulinemia plus, that's probably a good group to start think about, thinking about screening. Okay. Is there any correspondence to or be between gain of function and autosomal dominance? In other words, if you only have one of your, of your two genes that's overacting, you're going to get the disease because the other one only hold it back. Right. So, um, so that's, that, that's certainly a case. So, so um, we certainly see um, in many of these autosomal dominant disorders, we see gain of function. Yes, that is absolutely true. But we also see loss of function in autosomal dominant. So, so it, it, it's not that every autosomal dominant disorder is a gain of function, because we certainly see loss of function in autosomal dominant disorders. But what I'll say is that it's, it's not very common to see a gain of function in autosomal recessive disorders. This is really something that we see much more commonly in these autosomal dominant disorders. Uh, however, the flip side of that is that in autosomal dominant disorders, it can go either way. They can either be a gain of function or a loss of function. And, and for instance, in the STAT1, or so, let, me, let me give you an example, in the STAT3, those, both the, the, the loss of function patients that have hyper IgE syndrome, that's an autosomal dominant disorder, and the gain of function patients who actually have malignancies, they actually get tumors, they get LGL and other sort of adult tumors. Uh, those, again, autosomal dominant gain of function in STAT3. So it can go either direction. It has to do with where in the protein the mutation occurs, which domain is affected. I'm, I'm going to stop this just because we have three other yeah, speakers sure. we have to get to clinic. So thank you very much. Troy, All right. Thank back. you. Appreciate it. Steve, Steve is up next. We've got to somehow squeeze in two more speakers in 30 minutes. I know, great colors. Um, but ho hopefully we can do this one really quickly. It's a, it's a uh, not high science, but it's, I think, uh, this really important study that just was last week, I think, in, in, in Jack. I, and that's an open-label pilot study of pomalizumab uh, to facilitate more of a rush desensitization and, and subsequent updosing with um, for pe uh, oral peanut immunotherapy. Oops. Oh, my God. There we go. These are my disclosures. I, it, it takes about 45 minutes to fill out the, the actual hard copy disclosures, and I haven't done that. But these are the relevant disclosures because I, I do do um, PI and clinical research, but I, I don't get money for uh, food allergy consulting or anything like that at this point. Um, as a matter of background, everybody in this audience knows peanut allergy is a big problem. Um, and uh, is the big one for fatalities, even though that's a very rare event still, thankfully. Um, and accidental exposure is a predictable uh, event, um, though in an individual, I was amazed at how uh, there are some who've gone 15 years or 20 years without an accidental exposure, yet they still have a po very strongly positive oral challenge. But most patients do have some exposure over a five-year period. And this is the study itself. They set out to examine the, the safety and efficacy of this 
uh, oral desensitization through this novel method. Um, 13 subjects that ended up being age 8 to 16, they were willing to enroll up to age 25, but uh, they had to have a clinical history of a clinical uh, of a reaction within an hour and also a, a positive double blind test. So this could have been either at a screening clinic or um, as part of the study itself. And they also had to have a, a significant positive print test reveal. So these patients, I, I would say, with the exception of the double blind placebo controlled proof are a dime a dozen in our practices these days. Um, it, as usual, they excluded patients that had had near life ending or you know near fatal events in the past, which is sort of a important thing to keep in mind uh, if any of these treatments end up getting approved um, uh, when we're, when we're because there may be something different about those patients. Um, and this was the study design. So there's a pre-enrollment visit um, with, to do the, the double blind challenge, and that could have happened before, you know, six months before or whatever. Um, and then they began omelizumab, and this was dosed based on the asthma, you know, weight and, and, uh, and Q2 week or Q4 week rather than the urticaria type of dosing. And uh, they began the desensitization only after week 12, and they actually got everybody up to 500 milligrams in um, the first day. So six hours advancing every 15 minutes starting at 0.1 milligrams. Um, so, and that was, they had no, they had a couple patients with, you know, mouth itching, but really nothing to speak of with, with that updosing or with that desensitization. So they called that a rush desensitization. And then subsequently, the very next day, they came back and got their, their allotment for the week, uh, um, starting at uh, 500 milligrams, taking every day, and then every week going up um, over, let's see, it went from 500 to 750 to one gram, et cetera, all the way up to, to four grams. Um, and uh, that was that by week 20. Um, and then once they were tolerating four grams, uh, went to uh, go ahead and stop the, the omelizumab, and then for several more weeks and then eventually do the, uh, well, several months actually, and then actually do the double blind challenge again. So an interesting design, one that may have some practicality in terms of cost uh, if, if it's just a temporary uh, protection of, by binding the, the uh, IgE. Um, and this may be hard to see, but um, it shows individual patients. And you can see that a lot of them had uh, uh, greater than 100 KU per liter um, specific IgE, and they must have diluted it because they got a more, they got numbers up to 600 um, on those. And you can kind of remember individual patients. And in fact, uh, in terms of safety data, uh, majority of reactions were, were grade one um, and grade two, pretty mild. Uh, 72 out of a total of 3,500 doses. And one subject who they, kind in their description, but said the patient had a history of SVT and other things. That one subject accounted for 25 reactions and several doses of <laughs> epinephrine that were likely inappropriate based on uh, my reading of it anyway. Um, and then six out of, uh, roughly half the patients had nothing the whole time. Um, not a single grade one, either no reaction or a single grade one reaction. And as I mentioned, the rush uh, phase of this was fairly innocuous and uh, so was the updosing. Um, the maintenance phase, um, there were two grade three reactions. Um, one involved vomiting, diarrhea, and wheezing two and a half hours after a dose. So not, you know, going to scare us to death um, type of reaction. The other had coughing, hives, and wheezing, but was associated with exercise and actually had several grade two reactions with exercise during the, during the, the updosing. And so... Uh, this may be a common theme, and, and there were other, they didn't get into specifics about who had a viral infection, but over this, this uh, um, period of time, when you're in the real world, people have lives and they get sick, and there are all these risks of, of things happening. So overall, even though this was, if you took only 13 patients, a couple of them had grade three reactions, which is similar to the other oral immunotherapy data without, specific, uh, without monoclonal anti-IgE, um, overall, it's a much uh, easier course, and so I think the bottom line with this is that it uh, is promising preliminary data that, that uh, 
integrating specific IG or monoclonal anti-IgG into the the buildup it may make this a much cleaner uh, thing. But we're still faced with the uh, desensitization later in maintenance phase, resulting in in periodic reactions based on risk factors. So, and there's going to be double blind, you know, more uh, prospective su studies uh, that are actually ongoing now and about to start. Yeah. Did the authors try to speculate on the average cost in the real world to do this? No, I mean, I, you know, I'm I'm very sensitive to costs as well. And I, the question was, did the authors speculate on average cost? And 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 the answer is no. And I didn't have time to sit down in my cynical way and and try to calculate it based on the number of patients in the country with this. But obviously there's, hopefully by the time this is approved, and I, you know, uh, there may be a biosimilar uh, um, available. I mean, because there needs to be competition in that in that market as well, so, but it's a good question. Were they yeah. kept on 4,000? Sorry? Sorry? Were they kept on 4,000 milligrams? Like, like once they stop the, the Zoller, are they yeah. kept on the 4,000 milligrams? Yeah, it's a tremendously high dose. A high dose. A very high dose. And then and then the uh, subsequent challenge went up to, I think it was, I don't know, it was, it was the equivalent of uh, like 50 peanuts or something. So, so these patients were sort of super desensitized compared to some of the other protocols. But they also adjust the dose at maintenance. Like if they're sick, they either skip it for a couple of days and, um, you know, so there's, there's different, there's an art to to keeping them healthy that I don't have experience with personally. So, um, you know, but that's something that hopefully will, uh, that there, there's a um, sort of rules to follow with that. Thanks. I think go backwards on the grade two and grade threes to see if there was any correlation with baseline specific IG um, curiosity. Yes, and there was. Yeah, so the, so the baseline specific IgE level did predict um, reactions later as you'd expect. Um, and, you know, we don't have data from this study, but we know that, that binding up free IgE doesn't remove, you know, total IgE. Um, it, it changes receptors and other things that we're still learning about. But it, it, uh, it does seem to, in terms of, if you, if, you, if you think of this as desensitization, not tolerance, um, it does, it, it works great. I mean, you know, so you can get on peanut. The question is, you know, how uh, practical is that in an in long term and how safe is it when you're talking about millions, you know? So if, if, if are you going to exceed the mortality rate that exists already, which is very low, if you start putting, you know, five yeah, million yeah. kids on this? Last question. Yeah. Uh, are, uh, I, I, I didn't hear you may have said it. Uh, are they pre-medicated with other medicines? Could you just use prednisone and do the same thing It'd be a lot cheaper? <laughs> uh, the, the question was, can you just use pr prednisone instead of the, the biotech product? And the answer is, we don't know. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, when, when we used to do rush desensitization subcutaneously with inhalant allergens, it helped to have prednisone. But I think that the food is much more uh, volatile than that. Um, and we don't know, uh, you know, long term, you know, what... Uh, what can happen? But in the buildup phase, I don't. I don't think systemic corticosteroids are, are uh, um, a reliable thing. But I'm not aware of the data in the literature on that. It's more anecdotal. Let's move on to how and say Gary and Vinner are two at the end. Nothing complex. Of course, I am sitting next to you with my two questions. Sorry. The people who are on 4,000, have they ever just liberalized and done as much pain as they want? No. So I didn't say more than 20 grams of day or 50 grams of day. Not during the study. So uh, my first article is um, just a retrospective uh, chart review articles. And I picked this one just to uh, bring this topic uh, to the group. Yeah. So food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. This is a good um, retrospective chart. They, they found a huge cohort at Philadelphia. That, that's a referral um, clinic. Uh, a few of our um, professors come from there. But uh, FPIs, non-IG mediated food allergy, typically presents uh, within the first six months of life. A lot of us have um, experience from it that uh, get referrals for cow's milk and or, and, and or soy um, uh, FPIs. But, um, you know, the presentation of these children are pretty severe. They're, they uh, have severe vomiting. The delayed presentation is usually two to four hours after the ingestion. 
Um, they don't have any signs of Ig-mediated uh, diseases. You can do skin prick testing is usually negative. Uh, for this um, group, this cohort study in Philadelphia, uh, Dr. Nowak's studies, also proved that uh, thus far, um, a patch testing to food is also not very sensitive uh, whatsoever. And what this chart review sort of uh, hit me again, you know, when, whenever I see these rare group of patients one or two times in my clinic, is that um, my concerns for them, you know, we know all about this, it, is that the se severe presentation but still, a lot of these data are still empiric data. The recommendation is still to challenge these children 12 to 18 months after their initial presentation. Because by theory, most of these kids outgrow these food protein enterocolitis syndrome you know, within a few years. What concerns me is it's the, the growing spectrum of food. It's no longer just these um, you know, um, liquid cow's milk and soy, but now uh, the solid food are, are becoming more and more prominent. Um, wh what we worry about are, of course, the grains, mainly rice because it's the one of the early solid food introduced. But if you look at the data there, you know, now about 30 to 40 percent of these population are showing solid food FIs. And, you know, they, they go through a spectrum including meats, grains. But if you look at the uh, by, um, one of the data is, is, is in, in this study, uh, this cohort study, is that about five percent of them actually have six food or more, you know, solid food FIs. So, what I wanted to bring this topic up is, uh, you know, the age of onset we know, but uh, the age of resolution, as you see it, is not as the simple majority of them will outgrow. I mean, 80% will outgrow by the time they're five, but only 35% by two years old. This is the time when the primary care doctor will refer to us for oral challenges. And then if you talk about the impaired studies out there for oral challenges, about 30 to 40% of them will need IV fluid hydration because they will fail their challenges. You know, they may need dexamethasone pulses. So my big question about this from the state is, do we really want to do this in the outpatient clinic? And you know, that this, this really pushed the idea that we may, I, I mean, I encourage the concept of a referral center for, for these challenges. So, but that, I thought this was a great, um, a Jackie in uh, practice, uh, summary, but um, you know, just a quick summary. Uh, one, you know, majority of the patient will react just to cow's milk or soy, um, but usually, um, when they have, if they have cow's milk presentation, uh, do not switch them to soy. The recommendation is to do, you know, extensively hydrolyzed casein formula because a, a good portion of them will have also soy FIs. Fifty percent are triggered by solid food, most resolved by school age. Um, and then skin prick and um, patch test are not the lot. Anyway, that's quick, my quick summary. A yeah. quick question about yeah. that. Knowing very little about it, because we never see it uh, as adult, uh, really an adult patient stuff. <laughs> what is the pathology? Is there biopsies that show anything specific? Yeah. Is there any yeah. immunologic yeah. studies to support anything about the disease? No, no, there, this, this is still a history that makes a clinical history. Um, it's a cell media disease. Um, it, there's no real good biological markers to confirm disease in sensitivity. When they do studies, it looks like you, know, you could do um, a blood study. You see an elevation in neutrophils usually. There's um, elevation in tumor uh, necrosis factor, degradation in tumor growth factor. Um, if you do stool study, there. Their um, uh, elevation in eosinophils, elevation of uh, leukocytes, but none of them are specific, you know, at all. How about biopsying valves? Uh, I think a few studies, but not a lot. Do you know what showed? Um, yeah. Isn't it interesting that there's no IgE, but you still have atopic dermatitis, and a third yes. of them, and the common foods are the same. Yes. Yeah. Sort of like EOA, it's more common in atopic. Yeah. Do they, do they speculate why the foods shift from our children into adults? Because, I mean, you say milk and soy, but then when they're older, it becomes wheat and eggs instead of soy, and they sort of go above soy as an instance. Do they make any comments on why it's more soy in kids just as a formula? Yeah, 
I, I think it's uh, just because of formula. Yeah, the, so. You need to get Bill Clark to look at the, exactly. the recognition of it. Exactly. See if, if the epitopes are, <coughs> overlap with the specific IG, the, the patients that end up having IG mediated stuff. So. So my next article is just to um, uh, perk your interest in it. So this is usually my patient. You know, I, this article just humbles me, like so many articles uh, humbles me. But uh, I usually get the, a lot of patients refer to me because of diarrhea. I want food testing for diarrhea. And you go through your differential, inflammatory bowel, celiac, you know, or gastroenteritis from viral illnesses. Well, a few years ago, I saw one of my patients, I remember, specifically this patient. Severe diarrhea, thought it was every food allergy. What, one of the interesting thing is they were also going through neurologic abnormalities at the same time. They were sure food was inducing these autonomic peripheral pain issues. And, and so like most doctors, I inappropriately poo-pooed the whole concept out there. But, uh, but reading this article recently in New England, it just uh, reminds me that I always have to expand the differential as our medical knowledge increases. But I thought this was an interesting article. Um, so prion disease, transmissible neurodegenerative diseases, it can be inherited. About 15% of them have um, genetic mutations um, that's been identified, or it can be acquired, uh, uh, um, you know, the CJD out there. Um, and prions, just a quick reminder, are these there's a lot of controversies with it, but there are miscoded proteins. Um, they uh, aggregate and they bind to our central nervous system and it leads to neurodegeneration. And the prions themselves theoretically act as a template. So if you get it this, as a genetic abnormality or a transmissible disease, if you get the prion protein, this template then induces more production of your normal prion cell surface membrane protein to become more, you know, mutated prions that aggregate. So, anyway, this was just an interesting article where this group identified a kindred uh, population that had this unique phenotype, and they actually found a mutation in this uh, phenotype, a uh, prion protein mutation to explain them. And when they compare it with other patients with similar presentation, hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathy, None of them actually had this mutation, only this uh, kindred group. And this is uh, their pedigree, um, you know, where the dark boxes are, are the ones that they, uh, are the six of the 11 ones that they study. And the mutation is this mutation, the Y163X, and it's usually associated with a valine polymorphism, the M129 polymorphism. This, the M129 polymorphism is seen in a large population out there. A lot of us have it. It just means that we're more susceptible, by the way, to prion diseases. So, but the, the mutation itself is a one a Y163. But the presentation I thought was interesting. In their 30s, they have chronic diarrhea, watery, bloating, fluctuating uh, weight, you know, diarrhea. And uh, a lot of them are misdiagnosed with IBS, Crohn's disease. Um, and then in their 40s to 50s, they'll develop this sensory neuropathy, chronic um, uh, sensory pain or you know, um, loss of sensation. And then eventually they lead to cognitive defects and seizure and death is 57 years. What's interesting about this is one, the peripheral deposition of the prion proteins themselves. This is sometimes seen but not common seen because the deposition is often central nervous system, the cerebellar you know, nervous system. Um, and the second abnormality uh, or uniqueness about this is that um, it, it's uh, definitely the slow progression. Most, most prion disease are rapid diseases. You show uh, signs and symptoms of infection, and you die within a few years. So, but this is a slow progressive. And you know, what's neat about it is it's non-neurological presentation. These patients present to the GI clinic first before the neuro uh, clinic. So that's it. That's my quick, uh, interesting article out there. <laughs> so. Than enough time, right? That's one right. minute to talk to someone.
Actually, for years I've been somewhat skeptical about GERD, as people probably know here, as a cause of a lot of the ailments known to mankind that the EMT diagnose in every one of their patients. And uh, years ago, Wayne Slaley uh, went over and reviewed this about five, seven years ago, and I was impressed by the fact that there was very little data then to support it, but most of us were believers anyway. And, and that's because obviously pretty famous people were back this and believed it, based mostly on uncontrolled trials and clinical impressions or small observational studies. Anyhow, I went back to review it again uh, just to see is there any new evidence since Wayne Sladek gave the talk that any of this is uh, uh, well documented by appropriate controlled trials. Looking especially at the ones we, the first two that we see all the time, asthma and chronic cough, and uh, many of us treat uh, with uh, acid reflux type medicines because we're under the belief, uh, based on uh, the information we've had before, that maybe they, they are benefited by treatment. We don't see so much the hoarseness, chronic laryngitis, or chronic sinusitis that is frequently diagnosed by ENT and treated with PPIs. Anyhow, what I would review is uh, the controlled trials. Is there any evidence? And I'll go over these very quickly because uh, uh, obviously I didn't get much time. <laughs> Anyhow, controlled for my own son. My own son. Anyhow, uh, anyhow, I, I looked. I tried to look at Cochrane studies to look for meta-analysis type stuff to get the best data. And anyhow, on controlled trials of GERD and the Cochrane, they had 12 studies that looked at PPIs and six. By the way, this was in 2003. Uh, H2 antagonist surgery, conservative management of the treatment, one to six months. There is a temporal association between having an asthma and GERD. Uh, I think probably the real issue is that asthma causes reflux, okay, not the other way around, that, uh, based at least on these trials. And all the, going over all the studies, there was no consistent improvement in asthma symptoms, lung function, nocturnal asthma, or the use of asthma med and medications. The summary statement was there was no overall improvement in asthma following treatment for GERD. Now, there were uh, another meta-analysis looking specifically at PPIs for the treatment of asthma and adults, uh, looking at 11 trials and 2,500 plus studies. The primary outcome in this particular study was peak, uh, morning peak flow. Secondary outcomes looked at uh, spirometric data and, and symptom scores. And the results was there was a subgroup analysis suggesting a, a, a not insignificant trend toward improvement in AMP flow uh, uh, measurements. It was 18 uh, liters per minute uh, is how much it was. But th there was no difference in asthma scores, evening peak spiratory flow or spirometry. And the conclusion was a uh, small increase in AM peak flow is unlikely to be of meaningful clinical significance. There is insufficient evidence to re recommend empiric use of BPIs for routine treatment of asthma. Now, Another one we see all the time is chronic cough, and a lot of the, uh, the studies say that upwards of 50% of chronic cough are acid reflux. And of course, we all believe that because they've been published in studies, although most of that was in uncontrolled trials or observational studies. Anyhow, in the Cochrane database, they, they looked at the 19 studies that they felt a fulfilled criterion to be analyzed uh, in uh, six impedes, 13 adults uh, looking at GERD and cough. The treatment modalities that were looked at were up, included conservative measures such as diet, prokinetic a agents, H2 antagonists, uh, PPIs, and surgeries. As it turns out, there was not enough studies to do significant meta-analysis for uh, the conservative measures, the prokinetic agents, the H2 antagonists, and surgery. So mainly it's PPIs. They stress that one a good randomized controlled trial in the infants showed it was not efficacious favorite placebo and the children have more side effects from the drugs. Uh, and so it was not recommended to use it kids for this based on that study. And nine randomized uh, controlled trials with the PPIs, two to three months, and there was no improvement in cough. And again, the summary statement was insufficient evidence exists in the effectiveness of PPIs for adults with prolonged non-specific cough associated with GERD. Now, uh, this uh, just the criticism that some people would make is, well, you got to do high dose for a long time. That's been kind of uh, uh, promoted by people that are skeptical about these studies. This study did that. They did uh, looked at high dose uh, for in 40 subjects uh, uh, with uh, SMEP result twice a day for 12 weeks, 
endpoint. The primary endpoint was a, a cough-specific quality of life questionnaire. Secondary endpoint was another study like that and changes in laryngeal findings. And the upshot was there was no difference in, in, in the groups. And conclusion again, in subjects with chronic cough, rare or no heartburn, high dose PPI does not improve cough related quality of life or, or, or symptoms in this randomized control trial. Now, what about uh, getting into uh, other issues uh, such as uh, uh, acid reflux uh, causing uh, chronic laryngitis? Anyhow, they looked at uh, eight studies, uh, 344 patients. Primary outcome was a 50% reduction in self-reported symptoms. And jumping into the quick, uh, PPI therapy may offer a modest but non-significant clinic benefit over placebo in suspected group-related chronic laryngitis. Now, the, it getting even more speculative, but I, I believe not so much, I think, by us, but by your ENT, is that the chronic sinusitis or rhinitis may be related to reflux. And what they did is, this is not a meta-analysis, they just reviewed the best 19 studies there was of this, and the conclusion is there was no good studies. Uh, there are no good randomized controlled studies, and the conclusion was there is not enough evidence to consider anti-reflux therapy for adult refractory uh, you know, uh, chronic uh, rhinosinusitis, and there is no evidence that acid reflux is a significant causal factor in chronic uh, rhinosinusitis. And just the overall conclusions very rapidly, and not get into the detail, was causal relationship between uh, cough and all these symptoms has uh, remained questionable. Preliminary uncontrolled tri trial suggested response to therapy, but inconsistent value in subsequent uh, randomized controlled trials. If there is a relationship present, treatment remedies are clearly a, a questionable benefit. As it turns out, it basically comes down to this. If you believe there's an association, your patients will probably get better. If you don't, based on controlled trials, they probably So don't. we should all become believers, you're saying. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Care about the well, you know, and it comes down to placebo effect. And you know what? I think the real thing, we're buying time. Oh, that's right. Right. This yeah, is three, three months. And, and right. <laughs> Don't you think, though, uh, aspiration of gastric contents, whether it's acidic or not, is, is a factor? And don't you think the fundoplication is the real? How many of the, you cite just one study of surgery. But I think the issue for me is if you're aspirating bile juices into your, you know, well, that's the whole thing about theoretical right. considerations. Yeah, it makes right. a lot of sense. And it's just the data the don't support it. In the world aren't going to help and that. The treatment isn't gonna, doesn't yeah. support it. And there's no studies that show that surgery is a benefit. Right. So, you, you, okay. So, the real answer is yes, there, that's the theoretical considerations. It made sense. And I think that's why most of us bought into it. But when you go to appropriately controlled trials, you can't find support. Just as a side comment, Dave Parsons is in pediatric ENT did a number of studies in the 90s, they're small, but in kids, and, and these kids all had not only laryngeal, but actually nasal reflux, so probably a different disease than run of the mill curve, but he, he did find that there was a, a positive input with therapy. But again, we're talking, you know, smaller anatomy and reflexing actually all the way up to the relevant Area. No, you can find in studies, that, like in one study, it might say the peak flows got better, and another one, you might find quality of life better, and another one that says maybe fewer emergency room visits. When you take them collectively, you can't find evidence, and it's the same thing on small, you know, observational studies. You can't rely on them to, to get good data. I'm not saying that uh, that isn't a, the right place to start, but I think you do have to do appropriately controlled uh, trials. You're coming back to surgery, it's almost impossible to do a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, but most of the people that review this in the editorial comments is there's insufficient data to recommend surgery in these people either. Well, the same thing with kids, obviously, their anatomy usually gets better with age, too. Uh, it's like like two-year studies. But again, I think the biggest one is this chronic cough issue that we've all been believers on. We tell patients that three most common causes of chronic cough are, you know, asthma, post-nasal drip, and acid reflux. I think we should probably delete acid reflux. I usually just tell them Dr. Kennedy knows how to do that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Surgery. Surgery. Yeah. Fundoplication. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, thanks everybody who got through a lot. The next session is January 7th. We're all going to walk. I don't know what that session is. There's been a lot of very close places. So, you get back when you get your good going up this weekend.